So Global Health in Your backboard, uh, Backyard, uh, Viva Ecuador. Um, right away at the beginning, just want to say there's so many people that have helped us learn about this topic from people in the Latina community, in family medicine. Um, Patricia Tellez Giron, right from the start, helping us to get connected with the community and learn about herbal medicines. Um, folks in botany, this has truly been an interprofessional um, journey. Um, and folks in anthropology, including Bruce Barrett and Frank Hutchins um, down in Bellarmine University, one of our co-faculty on our Ecuador trips through Global Health, uh, Las Cis Latin American Studies Pharmacy. And boy, the, the herbal team, this is, I feel like I'm always learning something new about plants from my patients, from community members, from healers. So really, we're trying to bring that all of you today with our lens. Um, you know, with humility, our lens is certainly the Western view of healing, which Doug is in the middle of learning, and I feel like I'm also in the middle of. Um, but we've learned from folks in other countries, and most of our travel and work has been in Ecuador, which is why we brought that as a little bit of a focus. But gosh, you know, the ideal discussion on this topic would certainly involve, you know, a bigger budget when we could all get on a plane with a low carbon footprint and travel around to different countries and learn from um, people in their healing practices and follow folks like this guide um, who was leading us through the forest. Those have been, we've had countless walks like that and grabbing leaves, sometimes chewing them, um, tasting them, learning about the medicine. So we'll do our best to bring some of that uh, with you. Um, with our, again, our lens of uh, clinical practice here in the United States. So we certainly wanted to bring some plant discussion to you, um, probably for the first 30 minutes or so, and then a really interesting offshoot of our work in Ecuador and the pandemic and um, concepts of social connectedness and the contrast, social isolation and uh, health outcomes, um, which we think is really, really compelling and connects in with traditional knowledge and traditional medicine practices. Oh, heck, there's always an emotion, uh, an origin story. Um, in this case, this is me at the age of one. Um, I've always been interested in plants, as you can see. Um, helping my grandmother in her garden, you can see I'm working furiously in the hot sun with probably no sunblock back in those days. Um, took that interest into medical school, which is the other picture here, and I don't know if anybody can notice um, how healthy the plants look, um, but back in the day, um, you know, the plants didn't do that well in medical training. Um, they all died, and so I was wondering if there was some alternative to weaving plants, uh, traditional knowledge about plants and plants healing into the medical profession. So um, when I was in medical school, had the chance to, through a grant from the AOA Foundation here in Madison, um, to fly to Ecuador. And this is a picture of Ecuador, um, a very um, interesting country, um, geographically and culturally diverse. Um, on the left side of the country, you can see there, there's the coastal region near the Pacific Ocean. Right down the middle um, is the spine of the Andes Mountains the highland communities um, and some really beautiful volcanoes and communities that have existed at high altitude. And then to the right, which is where most of uh, my work has been done over the years, is the uh, kind of lowland or what they say is the east or oriente um, and the Napo River Valley that then leads into the Amazon basin. Um, a lot of indigenous knowledge, indigenous culture and language, um, primarily Quechua, but many other languages represented in that area as well. Um, and right from the start, um, spending time in those communities, this is a, a figure um, from many, many years ago um, showing, we think, um, a, a healer um, in a community in the Americas, um, kind of eating a plant as part of a ceremony. Um, but traditional healers and traditional healing practices um, are powerful and continue to be important for um, people throughout all of those communities. This is but one interesting factoid um, that if you ask a traditional healer, if you don't mind, would you share with us some of your um, favorite plants, some of your most powerful plants? And then with permission, um, of course, um, test those plants in various assays, you'll find that those plants, almost in like a pre-screening way, are the, 
the, the powerful ones, the most effective ones against a variety of diseases. So these, when we, you know, use our Western way of thinking and scientific method and apply it to traditional knowledge and the plants that come out of those cultures, um, invariably it bears out as, you know, these are really interesting plants, ones that um, have interesting uses uh, that are worth exploring. And I would not want to share any, um, you know, recipes that were given to me in um, in confidence, but I don't mind talking about some plants that are, you know, pretty well known in the literature and in the area we where we were, you'll often see in markets um, bark from this vine, uh, cat's claw or uña de gato that's um, being sold. I um, mean, it really, some of the little tendrils off of this vine do look a little bit like a claw. You can see it climbing through trees in the forest. Um, it's in the coffee family, uh, Rubiaceae. Um, Uncaria to tomentosa is the species name. Uh, Rubiaceae and other coffee type plants, I mean, these have um, effective chemicals. I don't know if anybody's ever derived um, some sort of physiological effect from drinking coffee in the morning. <laughs> But that would be an example of, of what some of these plants might do. And this is well known throughout Latin America, primarily South America, um, for having some really interesting chemicals. Um, alkaloids, called pentacyclic alkaloids, have powerful effects um, in the body as per various assays. Um, the healers that use these plants are able to identify the chemotype, so the specific plants that have these chemicals, and some of them don't make the effective pentacyclic alkaloid chemicals. So just an example of traditional knowledge and harvesting practices that um, help to guide um, people towards the effective plants in their community. And I just think that's a really compelling story. Um, on the next slide, when we look at those alkaloids, now, that didn't come across super well. Um, immunostimulant um, have immunostimulant effects, um, antioxidant effects, and anti-inflammatory effects. There are clinical trials for this plant um, on osteoarthritis that are favorable. So it's taking a while. There are hundreds of plants out there, probably more than that when we think globally. But little by little, as we look at some of the plants coming out of um, some of these favorite traditionally used plants, um, we see some really promising effects uh, clinically that we might eventually weave into our clinical practices. All right, this is quiz time. Um, we're in an academic institution, so I won't be able to see it, but I'll trust um, those of you who might wanna guess what you see in the foreground of this slide. What what plant do we think is, is going on there? And maybe Ann or Doug, could you uh, read some of the answers that are starting to show up? Because I can't see them. Sure. Yep. I'm on it. We've got aloe, 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 aloe vera. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We should just end this talk right now because we've got all these plant <laughs> experts in the audience. Um, that's exactly right. So this is um, comes from a, this is not a natural environment necessarily. It's a, a planting at one of the botanical gardens that we visited. But um, throughout Latin America, um, aloe is is prevalent, um, sometimes cultivated um, in around the house, sometimes found in markets. Um, and this was the beginning for me of this concept of global health in your backyard. So things that I would witness or experience in other places that I could sort of identify with, because probably we've all had an experience with aloe um, here in the United States. Um, often it's used topically on our skin for sunburn or other rashes. Um, but the same skin on our outside, we have sort of related skin on the inside, um, our mucous membranes. Um, and that same gel from aloe leaves can be used internally in certain circumstances um, to uh, lead to healing of that tissue. Uh, it's even being studied for post-radiation uh, therapy damage to the esophagus, so esophagitis that happens, and the internal use of aloe. So a really neat starting for me on these trips of seeing plants, like, wait a minute, I recognize that, and I also, you know, have heard about it being used in the U.S., and starting to wonder about bridging that gap between therapies that I heard about saw, read about from other countries and what might be happening in my backyard. Another example would be this plant, um, lemongrass. 
which maybe you've um, had in recipes um, or as an ingredient in various teas, um, yerba luisa in some areas in Latin America or te limon. Um, interesting lemon scent, which is similar to the lemon scent that might be in lemons um, or lemon balm, um, a mint family. And this is just really interesting for its antibacterial effect when concentrated and used topically or as an antispasmodic. Um, so that means that tissue won't, um, will relax essentially. If you talk to folks um, in Latin America and some places, they might mention that it's a calmante or a calming agent for the gastrointestinal tract or used for fiebre or fever. Um, and it's almost always used as an infusion in aguita or a little water, um, hot water poured over a plant um, in order to extract off its medicinal properties. And this is another one that started me thinking um, because um, I knew and was able to grow it in my garden. Um, I've seen it in, um, in recipes in um, various uh, restaurants um, for various dishes and I was able to purchase it um, at stores in the Madison area. So another example for me of a plant, um, this was a picture from um, Ecuador I believe I'm from Ecuador and um, also a plant that I had experience with in our backyard here. So, in addition to these plant examples, um, this started this process for me of wondering about ways that people think about their health and healing. Uh, this in and of itself could be a, well, a PhD, it could be a, a semester long class. Um, certainly, it's an extensive literature. And it's really hard to generalize because the cosmology, the way that people think about health and healing is very culture and region specific. But, you know, a few themes came up that felt different to me from the training that I had, which as a Western um, medicine physician felt a little bit more disease management. And as I delved into this topic for other cultures, started to learn more about preventive therapies, day to day things that one could do with um, thinking about their health and healing that was more preventive, um, that helped keep the body strong. And one class of herbal medicines that um, is not super typical for a way of thinking, I guess, in the US necessarily would be adaptogens. Um, these are uh, basically uh, plant substances that help our body adapt to stress, um, keep it strong, promote resiliency. And I just thought that was fascinating as um, I don't know if anybody else experiences stress on occasion, but if there's anything that could help um, uh, moderate that slightly, I was very intrigued by and or, you know, keep our system strong, uh, help us, you know, not get sick rather than just dealing with our symptoms once we are sick. In traditional cosmology, there's a lot of fascinating approaches to harvesting herbal medicines. Um, this could be such somewhat... Um, I guess, uh, distant concepts of uh, asking permission of a plant uh, before harvesting it, harvesting at a certain side of the plant, a certain so time of day, um, a certain season. And, you know, some of this felt like, uh, you know, a connection to nature and a connection to uh, the environment and ecology that it, it actually made sense to me as a way to promote sustainability. Um, and a connection to the plant world um, that isn't always the same as, you know, in my case, going into my pantry and opening the tea bag and pouring some water over it. Like there's not a lot of conversation with that product uh, necessarily. So it was really fun to learn about that and think about, you know, how I might bring that back to my patient population. Uh, another big topic that came out of um, our travels and work in Ecuador is this concept of food medicine. So things that you can eat that, you know, have a healthy um, uh, property to it, which we're hearing more and more about in various uh, nutritional recommendations that are coming out. But this is not a, a new concept for a lot of cultures. And then um, with some of our interviews that we were able to do in the Madison area, um, asking people about their plants and and the reasons for plant use is concepts would come up that felt just a little different to me that I couldn't pin a diagnosis on that I couldn't go into epic and choose a drop down for 
oh boy, after, something I might take after heavy meals or for my nerves, which wasn't the same as an anxiety treatment or a diuretic effect that was different than our class of pharmaceuticals called diuretic. And the last case listed there is something that someone might do for their heart. And we might want to just opine for a second here. If, if you were to do something for your heart, like what might that be? Maybe just think to yourself about something that you might do today or tomorrow for your heart. And maybe that's really easy for you. Um, and, uh, and in some places, there are obvious answers to that, or maybe you had to pause slightly and you're like, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, in our cases, we were able to um, learn about some plants that people mentioned, and one was ajo or garlic, um, which I'm sure we're all, we have experience with garlic. Um, I gave a reference there of a fascinating article where researchers um, <laughs> interviewed people in Colombia about their plant use and then found a Colombian expat community living in England and compared and some of the same diagnoses and plants that were used. And there's a shift that happens. So this is this concept of the herbal diaspora, how plants move across boundaries um, and across generations and what's gained and what's lost. And that is a rich area of investigation. Um, and I find it a fascinating topic to bring up with my patients. Um, you know, what, what do you continue to use that maybe your relatives used to teach you about? What have you not used anymore? What have you changed? Um, and so I think that that can be really, really interesting. With respect to garlic, um, you know, our interviews brought up all kinds of interesting daily preventive use for garlic in order to help heart. Um, the vascular system and um, support the immune system. Very commonly, it was the ingestion of about two cloves per day, which you could um, kind of just think a little bit about how that might happen in your daily life. Um, you know, those, there are different ways to make that palatable. Um, you probably want to warn your friends and family that you're going through a garlic phase, um, so they're not surprised <laughs> about maybe uh, breath, um, or it start to come out of the pores in some cases. But um, this has really um, interesting physiological effects. Um, some people prefer to take some of these extracts that are available, though they're a little bit more on the expensive side. But we know that it does affect cholesterol. Um, it takes a few months, probably. Um, and you can see some of the numbers that change there. Um, and this has been borne out in some uh, very robust clinical trials. So. This idea of for the heart, which is maybe a little bit more of a vague concept um, in Western ways of thinking um, that still has, you know, regular traditional use. And when it's looked at from the Western scientific lens, um, some interesting details come out of it. Um, garlic as a food opens up this really fascinating topic um, of all kinds of medicines out there, um, including prickly pear cactus that um, when used as a food, um, does have some fascinating hypoglycemic effects for diabetes. The pads, once they're despined, so don't try this at home unless you've had despining training for your prickly pear cactus use, um, when cooked um, is a fantastic fiber source, um, a, a complex, as they say, or low glycemic index carbohydrate that can truly help um, to uh, moderate um, uh, blood sugar or sugar or fat absorption. So it has really um, important effects. And lots of other spices um, show up that are, you know, you might consider a food um, in some cultures, um, but, you know, work wonderfully um, physiologically. And the spice rack of some of the grocery stores in the area, this is just one brand. Um, I don't have any financial interest in La Costanita. But this feels to me like a medicinal plant rack, um, even though it's, you know, a, more of a in the food aisle um, of some of these stores. So I just think that that is a really interesting um, thing to explore with your patients um, who might be, you know, using plants or incorporating a lot of spices and medicinal foods into their life. Well, um, I was about to say all good things come to an end, um, but I returned to 
uh, Madison um, in 2012. Um, uh, but I had been not in Ecuador this whole time, <laughs> but nonetheless, this was a chance to really delve into herbal medicine research um, through a grant from Bruce Barrett and with Patricia Tellez Giron's help um, through the DFM small grant program. Uh, and it was really um, great to learn about herbal medicine in my backyard, which if you're interested in this, the term that you might see in the literature is called urban ethnobotany. So learning about the cultural uses of plants um, in urban, more cityscapes um, in our backyards. And all kinds of themes come out of this, um, but we've talked about this a little bit today, this idea of plant use changing as um, plants and people move across borders into new um, uh, geographic areas. And some of the common themes to keep in mind is um, herbal medicine use in your patient population is high. Um, it really depends on what demographic you're looking at. We could probably generalize and say that um, people who are not born in the U.S. Uh, living here have brought a lot of plants with them, probably have a higher prevalence of use um, than people that were born in the U.S., but that's not always the case. Um, there are many plants that are being used, probably 300 different species in the U.S. Um, that you can find in various forms in grocery stores, in health food stores, and in pharmacies. Of course, I think about this and want to make sure that I'm aware of it, um, just like polypharmacy. This is a term you can now use with your colleagues, and they may smile when you say it, um, but polyherbacy. Um, is a phenomenon. People can use a lot of plants at the same time, and that may um, create issues with um, interactions um, to be aware of. And that is certainly the case with um, pharmaceuticals and herbals, um, keeping that all in mind. There's just a ton of unknowns. So if any of you are interested in this topic and want to pursue ethnobotanical type research projects, boy, there's lots of groups working on the different um, differences between different groups um, because sometimes the literature will lump groups together and say Hispanic use of plants or Latino use of plants, but we know that it's very regional um, and very specific to certain places what plants um, are more um, commonly used. If we learn about plants, um, research shows that there's increased patient trust. It increases communication, prompts disclosure of plant use if you show some interest and knowledge in um, plant use in, in traditional remedies. And this idea that if we don't learn about that, there is going, there has the potential to be a plant pharmaceutical interaction. So um, another compelling reason to learn about this. And certainly there's better adherence with our recommendations. Um, certainly as we match, um, you know, our interest, passion, background with that of our patients, that idea of a meaning effect that gets developed, um, a, you know, enhanced provider patient relationship um, uh, is, uh, is compelling. We put together a teaching case to help residents and students learn about this idea of um, ethnobotany, traditional uses of plants. Um, this was based on a, a you know, clinical situation I was a part of where a patient had type 2 diabetes super stable for years, and then all of a sudden had a couple episodes of hypoglycemia. I was trying to be the good herbalist, asked about medicinal plants, asked about herbs, got no for both of those answers. And so the question is, what might be going on? Well, it happened to be that this um, gentleman had just started to reinvigorate his diet with traditional plants and was eating much more nopal, nopalitos or prickly pear cactus. Um, and that was probably what was going on. His medications would probably, um, going forward, need to be adjusted. So a medicinal food comes out of a, a deep history on this topic with our patients. So that uh, just kind of tidying up this part, that's the clinical lesson here. You know, uh, Robert Benakdar had a book called Herbal, and the H is here. So here, what our patients are interested in, what they're using, do a deep dive into their herbal um, use, and hopefully that shopping bag of herbals um, is shared and you have full disclosure, and then you can help that patient to make decisions um, about, you know, their nutrition and their pharmaceutical use. 
and um, certainly getting in the habit of cross-checking all that herbal use with medication. So it's a little bit of where this journey kind of led to my local clinical practice um, and really trying to think about plants and how those connections happen across geographic boundaries. With pandemic, um, all kinds of things changed with people unable to find the plants that they needed. There was, um, we were learning from our uh, collaborators in Ecuador about um, increasing harvesting of some plants um, from the rainforest being shipped to the city. People couldn't do it themselves. There was a lot of sharing of this that happened, sending plants to relatives in different places with social isolation. And that brought up this whole concept of the, the health outcome we all went through for being isolated in our houses, in our communities, unable to visit family, um, whether it involves finding plants for healing or just community support. And uh, this led to a project that Doug was involved with over the last year. Thank you, Dr. Keeper. Hi, everyone. And uh, so continuing off of what Dr. Keeper is talking about, uh, my section of the presentation is with Ecuadorian migration and then, uh, the loss of that social connection. And, uh, I'd also like to touch on what he was saying too, with, it's, uh, one of the interesting things with research and the more you find out about a subject is the more you realize that there is that you don't know about it. And also in this instance, not experiencing your own. And so uh, while I like, was able to have the opportunity to go to Ecuador for the two-week global health trip and uh, over the past couple of months do research on the subject, there's a lot of humility with it and the realization that by no means uh, expert or on the subject. And that definitely welcome the input of uh, if there's anyone that uh, has experiences with this that they'd like to talk about or more to add. Uh, next slide, please. And so with the global health, health trip, uh, I was able to work with Dr. Kiefer and Dr. Hutchins. And over the course of two weeks, we were able to travel to a number of places in Ecuador, uh, predominantly staying in the northern region, uh, going to Quito, Amazon, uh, Otobalo, and then at the end, we're also able to do a short family stay and talk to them a lot. And so with this research project, we were looking at assessing the relationship that there is between the social connection and the health outcomes of Ecuadorian migrants, focusing on them, and then um, mm -hmm. oh, as other people that are involved with it too, so their families, and then if there's applicability to other groups. Uh, next slide, please. So starting now, uh, a good thing to consider with all this is like, what are the cultural factors for Ecuadorians that could be impacting their uh, sense of loneliness and uh, lending to it. And I think an interesting thing to consider is like what a person defines health as. And so there's been multiple definitions of health that have been used. And up until recently, it was basically looking at just the lack of illness. And now the World Health Organization is looking at it more holistically. And so bringing in like that social factor as well. But for <clears throat> indigenous and ancestral groups, they were always considering this as part of what health is for them. And so that plays a big part into their perception of how, what they're prioritizing and then also um, how they look at what is health for them. So they're looking at the micro part of it, as in like them as an individual, so their physical part, but then also spiritual connections. 
and then more like the macro sense of it of the environment around them society and then nature as well and so it's important to consider those aspects when looking at the health of especially the indigenous Ecuadorian and then tying in with that is the collectivist culture so with the community um, being a major part of it and Ecuador being much more community based than say like the United States which generally is more individualistic and then with like what Dr. Keeper was talking about with the sharing of uh, plant medicines for different things we were able to uh, on one of our stops and spending time with uh, the locals they were talking about how uh, a big part of how they handle things is the sharing of food, but then also when like an illness is going through um, the area, people have access to different plants from across the region and they'll come together and combine the different plants that they have access to or abundance of, and then combine it all together to make um, a remedy for it. And then they're able to share that throughout the entire community. So again, instead of one person trying to do it all, being reliant and participating on like the community work to solve something. And then um, another factor is that impacts uh, loneliness for them would be with mental health. And this is kind of a systemic issue with uh, generally, there appears to be a less uh, prioritization or I guess more so maybe access to resources uh, across Ecuador. Some areas having limited resources and then other like uh, more austere places having uh, <clears throat> an absence of it. And then this can lead to uh, a lack of education on <laughs> some things or a decreased prioritization of seeking help for something and then another issue is with aging out of place and this is um less specific to ecuador but more so of just when someone moves out of the area and the community that they've known their entire lives and place them somewhere else now they all of a sudden have that change of roles and responsibilities and maybe uh, like a loss of who they are and purpose. And then um, as I'll talk about more later, how this can affect uh, the elderly population more so. And then also is the uh, concept of uh, familismo. And this is the concept of like a sense of duty, loyalty, and placing family, both nuclear and extended, as kind of like the central focus for um, your work and your concerns. Uh, next slide. And so with these cultural factors, then looking at how they're impacting the relationship uh, between social connection and a uh, person's well-being, and so an interesting thing that was noted in some articles was the distinction between those connections being about quality rather than quantity. And so um, when community is really important, and this applies to a lot of instances too, where it doesn't really matter the amount of people surrounded by what matters is how much you can rely and depend on those connections and that's why the close family connections is so important for them and then when these are lost it can lead to things such as ambiguous loss and this was an interesting uh, an interesting topic because of how it plays into with immigration and so when with migration and then losing that physical connection to loved ones that 
um, maybe staying back home, there's no longer that physical connection with them, but there's still that emotional connection. And so unlike with the passing of a loved one where eventually it, a person is seeking closure and then they're both like able to come to terms with the emotional and physical aspects of it with migration, whether it's temporary or long-term, there's kind of that dissonance of uh, the two aspects. And then with this continuing on, it can lead to a, a chronic painful state that uh, predominantly children uh, are exposed to, but it also affects adults as well. And that's just, it's with the uh, difficulty of dealing with what one like expects a relationship to be and then what it they're perceiving to actually be in reality and um so it's that discrepancy between the two and then this can lead into other issues uh with mental health and also physical health as well uh such as like anxiety depression and then even uh, digestive issues or headaches and then um as I was talking about before with the access to mental health resources and the lack of them, um, that this lack of uh, knowledge on the material can also lead to difficulties with coping mechanisms. And so this um, has been seen as a reasoning for why there could be an increased risk of substance abuse and then with substance abuse, that can lead into decreased physical activity. And again, more so with the elderly population. And then these also leading to increased metabolic risk. And it's also important to note that uh, these don't necessarily have to happen uh, consecutively. Like metabolic risk can occur without uh, pre existing substance abuse. Um, or decreased physical activity. Um, it's just that they can also compound one into the other. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> and um, so there are a number of protective factors uh, to go against loneliness. And a number of these uh, are cultural, yeah, culturally relevant. And so, um, the first one being preservation of community, and this can be um, either like physical community in the sense of being able to stay tied with community or uh, form a new community and find um, a new community to tie into, uh, share and create that sense of uh, reciprocity. And it can also mean uh, culturally. So being able to continue practicing um, cultural norms that were held before. And so with community also is remittances. And this was a huge factor and a, a huge protective factor. And this is because it allows uh, migrants to be able to stay connected back with their family and community. Uh, because with remittances, it's the sending of uh, typically like money back to family and community members, loved ones, in order to support them. And for many, this is the reason why they uh, migrate in the first place, especially if they leave their family behind or if they're doing it on a temporary term. And so this is something that's uh, able to provide them that link back to home, and then also contribute to the familismo and that sense of duty. And it was noted in an article where many migrants feel that this is, that with migration, that with remittances, they don't feel that it's weakened their family ties at all. In fact, they feel that it's actually strengthened it because they're able to find that per that sense of purpose and fulfillment out of um, carrying out 
work and then providing for their family back home. And another aspect is religiosity and um, because it offers that sense of belonging into a community and um, a difficulty with it though is that with prioritization of work, they found that um, many who find that practicing religion is, while viewed as helpful, aren't able to actually um, make it to services, whether it's due to difficulty getting there or just difficulty with balancing it with their priority of work. And then finally is a uh, communication. And this isn't necessarily specific to Ecuador in any, by any means, but it's more so just being able to maintain um, frequent and reliable communication with family. And this has been found to be a major protective factor, uh, specifically against the ambiguous feeling that I was talking about before. Um, especially if someone's able to do something like FaceTime and see uh, their loved one. Um, and, but this again is something that the, with like the elderly population, it doesn't benefit them as much where we had gone to this one community center in Ecuador and um, they were talking about things that they try and do to uh, help them out in the community and because while like communication was pretty frequent at the beginning, it can um, start to become more infrequent or with like the use of new technologies, some of them uh, just aren't familiar with it and have difficulty with um, adapting to it. Um, next slide. <clears throat> um, so thank you. I hope you found that information helpful. And these are the relevant references to what we went over. And um, another interesting thing with it is the consideration of applicability to uh, other like migrant populations, especially across Latin America or even other parts of the world where community-based culture is a major focus. And so the summary with our presentation, uh, Dr. Kiefer talked about the importance of plant treatments and then their applicability and role in clinical encounters. And then with uh, the impact of social connection and uh, migration and that relationship, and then how going from community-based culture into a more individualistic one uh, can be spe be especially difficult.